The Brownsville Revival, also known as the Pensacola Outpouring, was a historic revival that happened in the Pentecostal movement. It started on Father's Day at the Brownsville Assembly of God Church in Pensacola, Florida. And between 1995 and 2000, four million people attended this revival. And I was one of them. And if you will check out our pictures here, you will see they are clearly dated to the late 90s. And I will tell you that this movement that happened, I had no idea that I was attending a historic Christian revival that would be studied in history. I was on a field trip with my church youth group. My mom loaded us up in her late 90s conversion van, had a VCR player, yes it did, and uh -huh, remember those? Okay, and so we took a field trip there, and I would love to tell you that I experienced the Holy Spirit in a way that changed my life, but this group of 13 to 17 year olds that I was with, we actually sat on the back row completely in shock and stunned, elbowing each other awkwardly because it was an experience so foreign to anything that we had experienced growing up in my small town Alabama church. People came forward, they were slain in the spirit, people fell out, there was healing, they were speaking in tongues, and that was very different than anything that we had experienced. And so what we did is we left really quickly and went safely back to my church, which was more interested in following the 10 commandments than following the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until I became an adult and trusted in Jesus that I began to explore the Holy Spirit and seek after the Holy Spirit and desire for the Holy Spirit in my life. And I have had encounters with the Spirit now where I've had physical manifestations, where I've seen uh, visions, where I've been with people who have authentically spoken in tongues, which Daniel is gonna talk about next week. And we are in a series called Ghost Stories because we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And what we've come to realize over the last couple of weeks is that the more we talk about the Holy Spirit, we find that there are more questions than answers. We have taught about Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit fell and became available for everyone and marked a new age in history. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit and how we find evidence in our lives that the Holy Spirit is working. And after both of those messages, both Daniel and I received a lot of questions. And so what we decided to do for this week is to take the most common questions that we have been asked over the last couple of weeks about the Holy Spirit and answer those today. So the first question that I want to answer today is this. Is the Holy Spirit a person? So if you heard my sermon from last week, I introduced a statistic that says that 44% of Christian, evangelical Christians could identify the Holy Spirit as a person, which means a large majority of Christians just struggle with the idea of the Holy Spirit being a person. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit being a person, a full member of the Trinity, we're saying that the Holy Spirit is not a force or an it. And the Holy Spirit is co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent with God the Father and Jesus the Son. And I think the challenge of understanding or believing or uh, wrapping our minds around the idea of the Holy Spirit being a person is that when comparison to God the Father or Jesus the Son, we can put our human experiences on God the Father and Jesus the Son. We know what a father is, we know what a son is. We know what that human experience is like of those two people. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the images that we see in scripture that we find in the Bible of the Holy Spirit, light, wind, fire, water, a dove, those all feel much more impersonal than God the Father or Jesus the Son. And there is a passage in the Gospel of John 
that is helpful for us when we understand the Holy Spirit as a person. And it happens in John chapter 14. Jesus is talking to the disciples before he is preparing for his death. And he tells them this starting in verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken to you while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And the reason that this passage is important, it's because of the word that John uses for the Holy Spirit in this passage. In Greek, the word is paraclete. Now, depending on your translation, this word has a variety of connotations. In this translation, paraclete is translated as advocate. But in other translations, you may find it translated as counselor, helper, or comforter. And this passage also tells us that the Holy Spirit is a teacher. And these are all human personalities that can evoke a very personal experience for us. Let me explain. So when we talk about human characteristics of a person or of the Holy Spirit, think about it this way, that the Holy Spirit as an advocate is the best lawyer that has ever served you, competent, and personal, the Holy Spirit goes before us, intercedes for us, and advocates for us on our behalf. And the uh, Holy Spirit as a counselor is wise, knowledgeable, patient, empathetic, a good leader, good listener, the best therapist that you have ever experienced. And the Holy Spirit as a helper is the best nurse who has ever helped you. Someone who is kind, caring, well-trained, attentive, and constantly at your bedside to meet your needs. And the Holy Spirit as a comforter. When we are in distress, when we hurt, when we are grieving, when we are suffering, it is often that we find the most comfort from people in our lives who love us. The words that they give us, the actions that they do on our behalf in order to comfort us. And when I think about the Holy Spirit as a comforter, I think about when my children were small and they would fall down and they would skin their knee or they would bump their head. And my immediate reaction would be to go to them and scoop them up and comfort them with my words and with my actions. In the same way, the Holy Spirit does that for us and then I think probably the easiest one for us to understand is the Holy Spirit as a teacher, because we've all had teachers who have impacted our lives, who have imparted knowledge and skills and truth that, that have changed us. And I think sometimes when we think about the Holy Spirit and experiencing the Holy Spirit or knowing that the Holy Spirit is present, we do think about these large movements of the Holy Spirit like revivals, and uh, manifestations of the Spirit in that way. But really, the Holy Spirit is deeply personal. If you have ever been reading God's Word and all of a sudden it is illuminated and you uh, see something that you've never seen before or you learn something that you want to apply in your life, that is the Holy Spirit teaching you. If you have ever been praying and all of a sudden you're praying things that you didn't intend to pray, they weren't on your list, but things are coming from your heart to pray and ask the Lord, that is the Holy Spirit as an advocate in your life, interceding in prayer for you. 
if you have ever just felt a sense of comfort in a time when you're walking through something that is really, really difficult, then the Holy Spirit is personally comforting you in your life. And so while we think sometimes that the Holy Spirit has to move in some big way, often the most common way that the person of the Holy Spirit shows up in our lives is in our day-to-day life to comfort, help, advocate, and teach us. So when we think about the foundational understanding of the Holy Spirit as a person, it's God the Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. So the second question that we have commonly received about the Holy Spirit is this. How do I receive the Holy Spirit? So in John chapter three, Jesus has a fascinating conversation with a man named Nicodemus. We find out that Nicodemus is a Pharisee, which was the Jewish sect or religious leaders who often opposed Jesus. And he is a member of the Sanhedrin, which meant he would have been part of the ruling body of the Pharisees. And it tells us that Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he comes to him at night. And he says to him in John chapter three, verse two, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. And Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. So Jesus tells him that in our first birth, we are born new humans. And in our second birth, we are born new creations. And who does the work of making us a new creation? The Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody, who was a prominent American evangelist in 1800, said this, someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is, all out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal. A body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837, and I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die, that which is born of the spirit will live forever. So applying this to my life, I just had a birthday this past week. I turned, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I turned 45, and I don't know if you know this, but what you get when you turn 45 is a referral for a colonoscopy. It's great. (laughs) I wasn't really expecting that gift, uh, but I'm gonna procrastinate that one maybe. But I was, if you apply this to my life, I was born of the flesh in 1979, and I was born of the spirit in 2003 when I gave my life to Jesus for the first time surrendered my life to Jesus, and I was baptized by the Spirit. I became a new creation. I received the Spirit at the time of conversion. So how does one receive the Holy Spirit? It's simply by trusting Jesus, surrendering our lives to Him, and it is at that moment that the Spirit comes, dwells within us, and makes us a new creation. So then, why does Jesus say, you must be born of water, and born of the Spirit. So this passage is a source of much scholarly debate. If you were to Google it, you could read all five interpretations of this passage. I'm gonna give you two prominent ones today. Some Christian denominations use this passage to support or interpret the idea that you receive the Holy Spirit not at conversion, but at baptism. 
And the problem with that interpretation is that Jesus here is talking about conversion. He is talking about being saved or born again, and he is not saying that you have to be baptized by water to be saved. Baptism is not mentioned in this context. The idea of baptism wasn't instituted yet in the Christian church, and it would have been foreign to this passage. So most scholars hold the view, and I do as well, that being born of the water is referring to spiritual cleansing. So when Jesus says that you must be born of the water and be born of the spirit, he's talking about what happens when you are regenerated, which is the theological term for being born again. You are born of the water, meaning that your sins are washed clean. And in the Old Testament, water, physical water, is used to symbolize spiritual cleansing or purification. So Nicodemus, as a teacher of the law, would have been familiar with the idea that water would wash away impurities. So what Jesus is saying is that you are born of the water, meaning your sins are washed clean, your idols are eliminated, your past is purified, and you are born of the Spirit, which means at that moment of conversion, you are washed clean and the Spirit comes to dwell and live in you that the Spirit becomes active within you at the moment that you trust in Jesus, and that is how you inherit the kingdom of God. So the message translation of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, he writes this in Ephesians 1:13. He says, it is in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This down payment from God is the first installment on what's coming. A reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. So this leads us to the third question. We know that the Holy Spirit is personal and works within our lives. We know that we receive the Holy Spirit when we trust in Jesus. So the question then becomes, How do I live in the Spirit? Paul tells us in Romans 8, 14, all who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. So if we want to be led by the Spirit, if we wanna live in the Spirit, we have to wrestle with and ask ourselves a hard question about our life. Do we want to be led or do we want to lead? Because most of us thrive on feeling in control of our decisions, both big and small. But the key to a life in the Spirit is to say that we would rather be led by the Spirit than by ourselves, and that means that we surrender everything. That we open our hands and we say, God, we will do anything, we will go anywhere, we will change anything. We just want your spirit to lead us. And that can be scary because what we want to do is keep the reins and hold on to things that feel comfortable or feel safe or our plans or to use our own logic and intellect and experience to make the decisions and plans for our life. Carl Barth puts it this way, He says, when we are at our wits end for an answer, then the Holy Spirit can give us an answer. But how can he give us an answer when we are still well supplied with all sorts of answers of our own? There is a true surrender that must come to live a life in the Spirit. Because the thing is, the Spirit will lead us, but the Spirit won't force us, won't push us, won't coerce us, won't hurt us like cattle. And often what I want the Holy Spirit to do is I want the Holy Spirit to come alongside me and help me with my plans that I have made, the decisions that I have made, the things that I want, the things I'm asking for. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we don't need the Holy Spirit to help our lives. We need the Holy Spirit to take over our lives. 
And when the Holy Spirit takes over our lives, inevitably, the Spirit of God is going to lead us places and lead us in a way where we will do things that we never would have decided on our own. In my life in the Spirit, I've had to move states, give up people and relationships that weren't good for me, give up comforts and habits that were painful to let go of, change careers, change callings. I've had to think about my time differently, I've had to give away money, and I have to, on a daily basis, try to die to my ego and self in order to follow the Spirit. And so when you give your life to the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, God might ask you to love someone that feels difficult to love. God might ask you to serve in some way that feels uncomfortable to mentor someone or to serve the homeless who are needing a word of encouragement or a meal or travel halfway around the world to serve people who are different than you without the comforts that you have at home. The Holy Spirit may refine things from your life and make you give up things that feel comfortable and to make yourself more generous or to give away money or to open up your home. What happens when we give ourselves to a life in the Spirit when we listen and we obey and we discern, is that God will light a fire inside of us. And that Holy Spirit burning in us doesn't just change us, but it changes everybody else around us because it is contagious. Relationships are different, needs are met. The world will be different when we as followers of Jesus live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is nothing in scripture that says that the power that Jesus possessed and the power that the apostles possessed, there's nothing in scripture that says that that power is not available to us. Instead, it says something very different. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he says, nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then he says something startling. He says, I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus says that the spirit inside of you is better than Jesus beside you. That we have full access to the same power in our own lives. And as we learn to live by the spirit, it is a day by day, step by step, listening, being in community, discerning, reading God's word, praying, looking and being willing to follow the Holy Spirit, but the key to unlocking it is to live a life of surrender that says, God, I want the same power that I want to be led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is personal in each of our lives, and the good news and the promise is that the Holy Spirit is available to each and every one of us. So as we move into our time of communion, I wanna take just a few minutes to pray, that we would pray together and that we would ask God for a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit today. Won't you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. God, that through his sacrifice, that he made the way for the Holy Spirit to come and live in us and among us. God, we declare that we want your spirit, that we want the presence of your spirit here and moving in our lives and in our church and in our family and in our community. And if you came here today and you are listening to this message and you are thinking to yourself, I don't know if I have that kind of power inside of me, but I want it. 
I want you just in a posture of receiving to turn your palms up right now and pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I desire for your spirit to be in me. I want to give my life to you, Jesus. I recognize the ways that I've been trying to do it on my own, that I have tried to make a way without you, and I wanna lay my life down right now to you, Jesus, and I want your spirit to make me a new creation. God, I pray now that your Holy Spirit would just free them from the things that bind them. They would walk out of here today with a new life of grace and mercy and peace and joy that you give us because of your spirit. And then if you came here today and you feel weary, if you feel burdened, if you feel as if the things in your life that you are praying for or asking for, that you just do not see how God is working, that if you feel that you are walking through suffering or a diagnosis and you need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, I'm just gonna ask you to also put your palms up in a posture of receiving. Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would move and that you would touch those lives, that a fresh wind, that a fresh fire would move through them. I pray that you would heal, restore. God, I pray that you would be their advocate, their teacher, their helpful, their comforter. I pray now that they would feel your physical, tangible presence. God, that you are with them in their lives and that you would reignite the fire in them to give them the strength and the perseverance to live a life faithful to you. God, we declare that we're dependent upon you. We're dependent upon your spirit to work in our lives. So God, we ask that you would do that, that you would fill us, that you would fill us to overflowing with the spirit that you promised us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to the table together, what we're remembering is the way that Jesus gave his life for us so that we could receive the Spirit. It was on the night that he gave himself up for us that he gathered the disciples in the upper room and he took the bread and he broke it. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the common cup. He gave thanks to God and he passed it around to his disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my cup, my blood of a new covenant. Every time you drink of this, remember me. Well, I ask now those who are serving communion, if you would come forward while we pray. God, thank you for your gifts of mercy. Thank you for your gifts of grace. Thank you for pouring yourself out for us on the cross so that we could be your sons, we could be your daughters. God, that we could experience the life here on this side of eternity that you gave your life so Holy Spirit, we ask that you would pour yourself out on those of us gathered here and on this gift of bread and cup, that it may be the body and blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood, amen. As we move into communion, the ushers will lead you forward and we take communion through a method called intinction. That means when you come forward, you will be given a piece of bread, you will dip it in the cup, and you will take the communion. All of our elements are gluten-free, if that is a concern for you. And then also, we know that the intinction method some people aren't comfortable with, and so we do have the individual packets uh, elements, and I'll be right here, and I'll be happy to serve you that if you prefer. One of the most beautiful things I think of being part of this faith and part of this church is that we have an open table, which means that you don't have to be a member of our church, you don't have to be a Methodist, you don't have to call this church home, our table is open, it is an invitation for you. All you need is a willing heart to come and receive the grace and mercy that Jesus wants to give you. So the table is open, come taste and see that the Lord is good.